You guys are way too happy before Sunday school. I'm not going to have that this morning. Galatians 3. Since we're not out of Galatians 3 yet, you know me. We're going to take every piece of chicken off the bone before we get through with something that we do. No reason to rush. Uh, The Lord will come in His time for each one of us. I believe we're here to learn His Word. I just determined when God laid His calling on my life, I didn't didn't take um, Bible college too seriously. I'll say it that way. Um, Which is probably probably good. I, I did learn a couple things there and learn some learn some things that just kind of made me wonder at why people think the way they do. Um, but the things that God has taught me through his word uh, has been far more uh, beneficial to me and enlightening than probably most of what I learned in Bible college. Uh, Galatians 3, uh, we're going to start in verse 19 this morning and, and just sort of uh, ask the question. I may have uh, got into this last Sunday morning, um, but it, it answers, to me it answers the question, why did God put sin in this world? And um, the other night, uh, we were having a little Bible study, and we were talking about sin. And if sin were, if sin was excruciatingly painful, utterly distasteful, and had no appeal to it whatsoever, nobody would do it. Or only maybe very few weird people would do it. But... Sin is very pleasing, very tempting, nearly, nearly impossible to refuse, and God made it that way. When Eve looked at that fruit, she didn't go, why would I, why would I eat that? It looks awful. Okay? Um, Did you hear about the... $120,000 $120,000 banana artwork. Who heard about that? Some stupid, it's got to be New York, modern artist taped with duct tape a banana to the wall as artwork. He or she did it like three times sold two or three of them for 120 grand a piece. And then, a couple days later, came in, sat down, ate the banana off the wall. Art! Uh, yeah. Yeah, who's this? Yeah, the stupid idiot that put it on the wall or the stupid idiot that bought it. Which is worse? Yeah. I, I've said this about Isaiah 28 where it says, it talks about the prophets being drunkards and it says all tables are full of vomit. And I think of the communion table and I said there's the only thing worse than a preacher that serves up vomit every Sunday or the dogs in the congregation that lap it up. You know? Anyway. So why did God... I mean, he put one sin on the earth by way of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and telling them not to eat it. But when Eve looked at it, everything about that fruit was immediately grabbing her body's, her flesh's attention. It was lust of the eyes. It was very appealing to the eyes. It was good for food. She saw that it was good and it appealed to her pride to make her wise and she went for it, and every sin is that way. So then God take us, takes us from one sin in Adam 
and leads to Mount Sinai and gives them ten commandments that they shall not break. And it's like, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness. And then the number ten one pretty much covers everybody. Thou shalt not covet. Well, that covers everybody because there isn't anybody who's ever walked this earth that's never coveted something else that they didn't have. Nobody. And I've said this before. You may be good at keeping nine commandments, but you break ten. You break the number ten one probably every week. And so, and there's a reason for why God did this. And so he st starts out in Galatians 3, 19, Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added. Notice the word added here. It was added. God compounded sin. It was added because of transgressions, plural. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And the seed should, that, till the seed should come is Christ. Till Christ comes who fulfills the law, who's, he's the only one this is why this is why Jesus had to be fully man. If he's only half man, uh, it doesn't count. It's cheating. If if Christ really wasn't born with the sin nature dwelling in him, then it's cheating. God sent His Son, who was fully man. He was fully capable of committing the sins that were presented to him. He was fully capable of falling to the temptation that Satan led him to in the wilderness. And we know, I've said this, we know that Jesus was very weak when Satan came to tempt him. So it wasn't the strength of his flesh that, that held him through. It was the power of God's word. So why did God add then all of these sins to this world? Why did God make them so appealing? Why did God make them practically, utterly irrefusable, unrefusable, if that's a word? So Romans 2, uh, we, again, we may have went there last Sunday morning. I was trying to remember. Romans 2, uh, very quickly, thou art, uh, verse 1, thou art, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest, do us the same things. So basically, and we're going to get into this, it's the idea that sin is going to catch everybody. There isn't going to be anybody in any church that hasn't sinned. We're all here because we are sinners. And we need to be here. So what one person has done is no better or worse than what some other person has done. So everybody's inexcusable. We are sure, verse 2, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them, all of us, which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou that, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Because you put others down for their sin? Does that make you excused by God? No. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So God is the only one who is worthy to judge people because he didn't sin. So verse 11, same chapter. There is no respect of persons with God. And that couldn't be preached enough all over this world. You know, we're, we live in America where, you know, the idea is, the American dream is everybody has the chance to do well in America. It, it's the land of opportunity. It's, and we say that because... And if you ever go to other countries, the old world, they still do things the old world way. If you go to India, in India, 
they still classify people by their, what is it called? Their caste. And because they still believe in reincarnation over there and karma, don't ever say, I believe in karma. That's your, that's a, I hate that. Karma is the idea of, of um, past lives, reincarnation. That whatever, if you were born into a poor family, they believe it's because in a past life, you lived a terrible life and you deserve to be born in a poor family and you will stay in a poor family. You will stay poor the rest of your life and the rest of society will make sure that you do. You will never get offered a decent job. You will never get the ability to buy a better house. You will not be provided the opportunity to have a better life for yourself, which is why most immigrants wanted to come to America is because at least they would have an opportunity. I mean, how many immigrants came over to this country and became millionaires? Multitudes of them. They found out that in America, you could do that. And so even those who were brought over as slaves, when they were freed, they did well for themselves. Okay? Um, so anyway, there, and there's no respect to persons with God. God sees everybody exactly the same. Sinners. Whether they did one sin or thousands of them, God sees them the same. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. See, the, even the Gentiles, us Gentiles, we, we were not given the Ten Commandments, but we have it in our hearts written there i mean it, in gentile lands all over the world it was still wrong to commit adultery it was still wrong to steal it was wrong to murder somebody in an innocent person these are universal laws all over the world even before the bible began to be published throughout the world it was still wrong to do these things that shows that the the law of god is universal written in the hearts of man we just know when things are wrong um Verse 15, we show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I mean, did Jeffrey Epstein really hang himself? Nah. Nah. And for those of you who don't know who this is, this guy, multi-billionaire, owns this island out in the Caribbean, and all of these very powerful, wealthy people that he knows gets to fly down there and sleep with all these underage prostitutes, including the Duke of whoever he is in England, Prince Andrew, okay? I mean, he's caught. He's caught red-handed with his arm around this 17-year-old hooker, okay? He's guilty. Everybody knows it. So they put Jeffrey Epstein, the guy who owns this place, in jail. And all of a sudden he hangs himself. I don't believe it. This guy had a list of names of too many very powerful people. And he was probably going to turn them in. And that's what they were afraid of. He was, no doubt. So... All of these men in the world with all their dirty little secrets, now that he's dead, think that they're going to get away with this. You can't hang God. God still has the list of who's guilty. Amen? And God will judge every, everybody's dirty little secret. God will judge them. God will judge them. You, you know what your best bet is? That God comes down on you hard in this life to give you a chance to repent. Amen? That's your, that's your best arrangement. God offers you a deal. Repent now, I'll forgive you for eternity. But if not, I'm going to hold it against you for eternity. Um, 
Turn to Romans 3. Romans 3, 19. We use the verse Romans 3.23 in what we call the Romans Road of Salvation when we're, we don't read people the whole Bible and ask them then, do you want to be saved? We give them key verses about salvation. Romans 3.23 is one of them, but Romans 3.23 has a context that it's written in. In verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world is guilty before God. Therefore, and I know some people that I, I wish would read this, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. I don't care what you did good. You still sinned. Still have to be, that still has to be dealt with. So, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, I've used this illustration before, but I like it. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk who was taught that you must pay for your own sins and you must become righteous. You must never do any evil thing. So, as a Catholic monk, he decides then that he can become sinless. So, understand what he did to himself. He secluded himself in a monastery so he would not be driven to lust after anything out in this world. He secluded himself from everything in this world. Catholic monks, and they still do this day, don't believe the lie. They have what's called a flagellum. And it's a self-whipping thing where they beat themselves and thrash themselves until they are bloody every time they have an evil thought to drive the evil thought out of them. And he did this to himself often. And he's reading the book of Romans and he's angry at God because he has been a monk now for years. Fastened himself to the point of near death. Weakened his body. Thrashed himself violently. Blood coming down out of his body. Separated and segregating himself from everything in the world. Spending long hours in prayer and study of the word of God. And he is still not capable of driving the sin nature out of his flesh. If anybody could do it, Catholic monks could do it. And they can't do it. So he's going through Romans and he's angry because he sees this phrase, righteousness of God, like in verse 21. And he's angry at God for demanding that Martin Luther must be as righteous as God is in order to inherit heaven. And then one day the Holy Ghost came to him. And through the word of God, Martin Luther understood. It's not, wait a minute. It's not the righteousness that I must attain to to be perfect like God. It is the righteousness that God clothes me in so that when God sees me, he sees me as holy as his only begotten son is. And that changed his life. From that point forward, he starts 
contemplating now, what's wrong with the Catholic Church that I'm involved in? What's wrong? And this is when he nails his 95 thesis to the Wittenberg door and all of his complaints against the doctrines of Rome and why he no longer believes in them. Okay? And um, now, the poor people who followed Martin Luther in the Lutheran denomination, I mean, they didn't fall too far away from the Catholic tree. They still have idols in their church that they bow and pray to. They still believe in a type of work salvation in that if you answer all the catechism questions correctly and join the church, you're automatically a member of the kingdom of God. These are all false salvation ideas. But it's, that's, that's what Martin Luther came to. Verse 22, even the righteous of God which is by faith, you believe in Jesus Christ, you, God gives you his righteousness unto all then upon all them that believe for there is no difference so if and think about this if there is no difference in all those who are sinners there is also no difference in all of them who believe amen so if the worst of us in this congregation if the worst of us believe the Word of God and believe in the Son of God, they are just as saved as the best of us. That's what that means. There is no difference. God may have to whip them more than He does other people. But whip them he will because they are his sons and there is no difference. I do not believe that, those, that there are groups of people in heaven who are classified as having better rewards than other people in heaven. I do not believe that there are neighborhoods in heaven and that's the good neighborhood and this is the not so good neighborhood. I don't believe that. It's not biblical, it's not right. And I, I've been told that, well, you'll get, you'll get greater rewards in heaven. Show me that in this book. Show it to me. Anyway, verse 24, uh, no, uh, back up, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the context that it's in. So let's go back to verse 22 and read these two verses together. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then you go to the next verse, because it's all the same sentence here. In fact, you have to go back to verse 21 to find the beginning of this one sentence. So verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, still the same sentence, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Still the same sentence, verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. End of sentence, finally. Verse 21 all the way down through verse 26 is the same sentence. Same sentence. Same thought. So you read those verses together next time you read them. Because they're all the same. And verse uh, 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So I'm going to say this again. The worst of us in this congregation is still as justified as the best of us in this congregation. God doesn't give more or less justification to one as opposed to the other. If you are justified, you are freed and all of your sins are blotted out. Do we not believe what was read to us probably when we got saved? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of 
all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no exceptions in there for someone who goes over a line and does more than God's recommended daily allowance of sin. In fact, if you take the verses in the Gospels, one Gospel, somebody comes to Jesus and says, uh, Lord, how often shall we forgive our brethren in a day if he sinned against us seven times? And Jesus says, yea, I say until seventy times seven. That's 490 sins in one day. I dare say that any of us at our worst committed 490 sins in a single day. Although I know some people who probably tried it. Okay? Um, but whether they committed one or they committed seven, all is forgiven. Amen? So, verse 27, new sentence, where is boasting then? It is excluded. So this is why, and think about it again, this is, the question is, why did God put so many sins down here? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Nobody, nobody can boast. Nobody can. For if one says, I would, I would sin 20, 50 times a day, every day. And one said, I would sin two to three times a day. Is there any difference in them in God's eyes? The answer is no. Why? How can one boast who's been redeemed? How can one boast who's been redeemed over another who's been redeemed if at the end of the redemption, they're all equal? Me personally, it's the people who were the worst that when God saved them and he made saints out of them and you saw a huge difference in them, those are the people that I like to hear from. Amen? Those are the testimonies that are worth listening to because they talk about how deep the pit was of sin that they were in. So, uh... Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Verse 27. And then he says, by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And again, I know somebody and I'm very troubled by this, but I saw it coming. They have turned over to a form of work salvation, but you would never get them to admit that, but it is. Because it says, I keep the Sabbath days, we go to church only on the Sabbath day, we keep all the Jewish feasts, we keep the Jewish dietary laws. Big deal. Big deal. Because if you say that you keep the law on one point, if you say that, then you are saying, I will attempt to keep all of the law. And it's not possible. Not possible. So Romans 5. Turn there. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience. In Romans. I love Romans 5. It's a little hard to understand until you really get into it and think about it. That's why you're supposed to meditate on the scripture. Think about him. Think about what he's saying. Here we have one man, Adam, who sinned one sin. So here we have Christ, one man, the second Adam, who does no sin. So as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So that's why Adam had to be the very first human being ever. Ever. And all humans come from the single man, Adam, single, no, nobody other than Adam and Eve. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So there's over 7 billion people on the planet now, which means there are over 7 billion sinners on the planet right now. 
For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, who is Christ, shall many be made righteous. This was the plan of God. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. God did this on purpose. He made so many different sins. Because while one person, who in here likes grapefruit? You eat grapefruit, you love grapefruit. What is wrong with you? You wake up in a sour mood in the morning, then you eat grapefruit, you're going to get better? I hate grapefruit. Oh, I can't stand it. So, if me and Todd was in the Garden of Eden, staring at a grapefruit, I'm sorry, Todd, you're going to hell. But I'm not, because I'm going, I hate those things. So, that's my point. What if there was somebody that showed up that went, looked at that fruit and said, why would you eat that? That's, ugh, that's terrible. Okay? So God said, well, I'm just going to put so many sins down on everybody that nobody will refuse. And that's what he's saying here. For more of the law entered that the offense might abound. So everybody's guilty. And then, that's this, this is where this verse comes from. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you notice, I'm a numbers guy. So I pulled the numbers. The word sin, 336 times in the Old Testament, only 112 in the New Testament. I'm showing you the difference between the Old and the New. Whereas grace is only 39 times in the Old Testament. And there are 39 books in the Old Testament. Grace is found 131 times in the New Testament. So where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You got sin only 112 times in the New Testament. Grace is 131 times in the New Testament. So there's more grace than there is sin. Amen? Now Galatians 3. Turn back there. Galatians 3. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it is ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Um, I've spoken about this before. You have the mediatorship of Moses in the Old Testament. I, I taught about this the other night. If you, you have all the people at Mount Sinai and God is speaking, and yet when they hear the voice of God, it puts terror on them, and they are afraid they're going to die. What voice that might be. All, and all these people who say they hear the voice of God, they are lying through their teeth. Okay? So, well, Pastor Mike, you've said God said to you, yes, hear, hear. But they heard the voice of God and it terrorized them so bad they were afraid they were going to die. So they said, Moses, from now on, you go listen to God and then you come tell us and then we will listen. That's what they said. So then why did Korah show up one day? Why did uh, even uh, Aaron and Miriam, Moses' brother and sister, stand against Moses saying, what, are you the only one who God speaks to? Well, that's what they said at Mount Sinai. Moses, you hear from God and come tell us what he says. They wanted in on that. They wanted, I guess, the glory or whatever. Um, so Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. But here's the question. Did Moses get to go into Canaan land? No. Why? He sinned. 
God told him to speak to the rock the second time. And Moses was angry at the Jews, which I can see his point. It's easy to get angry at the Jews. So he gets angry at them, and he's mad, and he smites the rock. And yes, water came out. But God pulled Moses aside, took him on top of the mountain, said, Moses, there's Canaan land. Isn't that pretty? You're not going there. And the picture of that is God will not allow the law to, the law will not lead you to the promised land. You might see it, but you'll never go there. If you think keeping the law, even part of the law, like some of the Hebrew roots, Seventh-day Adventist, sacred name, whatever, if you think that even keeping part of the law justifies you before God, you are wrong. Moses doesn't get to lead anybody into the promise, and he still doesn't. He still doesn't. So, but Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. That's why there had to be a second person to come and lead them in the promised land. So that was Joshua. So now Christ is the mediator of that new covenant. If we have a new covenant, then it's a new mediator. An eternal mediator for an everlasting covenant. And it has to be that way. Verse 20, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So, in other words, you don't have a contract with yourself. You can't make a contract with yourself. It has to be two parties, and there has to be someone mediate that. So that's what he's saying here. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. And that's the point I've made. If you go back and read all through the Israelites' journeyings in the wilderness... I don't believe you're ever going to see one place where God said, if you keep these commandments, I'll let you live in heaven. I'll give you everlasting life. I don't believe you'll ever see it there. Because I don't think that God ever, ever intended that the law would give anybody everlasting life. Even if you kept all of it, which nobody did. That's what he said. If, if the law... Which, uh, which could have given, if there had been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. It's not until the new covenant that Jesus says, and whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. The old covenant was to give Israel an earthly promised land, but not a heavenly. And they don't understand that to this day. We're going to study that next Sunday. Who remembers a day when a teacher could spank you in school? That's a foreign idea to school kids now. Doesn't exist. To me, lawsuits. So that, and what this is about is, Paul said, the law is a schoolmaster. Okay? And those of us who lived in the olden times, we get that. We get that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the chastisement of peace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for making us equal. All the same, by grace, whether the worst of us here or the best of us here, we'll all join together around your throne, celebrating grace, thanking you for the word of God, thanking you for faith. Bless your word in the hearts of those who listen today. Give us peace, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen.